So I want to rewind a little bit. My story on mobility starts a little bit almost a century ago in the year 1888. This is an unusual story of this woman called Bertha. She lived in a city Mannheim in Germany. She went and sneaked into her husband's garage or barn at that point, probably, and stole her husband's invention, got her two kids along, and took a 100-kilometer journey to her mother's place. No, she was not trying to get a divorce, no. <laughs> she wanted to publicize her shy husband's invention, and that was the very first automobile as we know it. Her husband's name was Carl Benz. We all know it as a company today called Mercedes-Benz. Changed the way transportation happened. Changed the landscape of mobility. Changed our access. Changed generations of how people thought about moving around. Carl Benz was ingenious because he brought in a gasoline engine, a transmission unit, a braking system, a steering system, packaged it all together on a horse-drawn carriage sort of scheme and made it work. But he had not the courage to sort of expose it to the world because at that point, even the church was against such an idea. How could you beat the horse-drawn carriage? Yeah. So it takes a lot of excellence in engineering, innovation, the courage to go against the norm, and industrial scaling in order to bring such ideas out to masses. But what happened after that was an explosion. It's nothing different than the equivalence of smartphones and apps today. People took up the automobile in a very big way. Paradoxically, the early automobile race was between electric cars and gasoline cars. The gasoline one won, of course. Yeah. Um, but it took 40 years of total chaos, pollution, accidents, crazy streets with horse-drawn carriages, gasoline-driven cars, people, bicycles, everything, for someone to figure out that they need to control the traffic. So in the 1920s, a man came along and he sort of patented this thing called the four-way traffic intersection light. Ingenious, because for the first time, they figured out, OK, we should control all this mayhem. But there was a very strategic reason. Apart from just um, controlling the number of accidents, actually, it regulated the way cities performed. So moving forward, almost 100 years now, we still have this amazing thing called the four-way traffic intersection. Our cities are full of these. Right? And we encounter so many of them almost on a daily basis. But the paradox of all this is that this configuration of intersecting traffic is a bigger challenge than the automobile industry itself. And weirdly enough, the total amount of money that's spent just in 2013 in the States alone is about $100 billion on wasted fuel and time of people waiting at traffic intersections and decelerating and accelerating out of them. Quite incredible, don't you think? Especially, even more incredible, when you compare the amount of R&D and the amount of money and innovations and ideas that go into making cars more efficient, more faster, more fuel efficient, more safer, fantastic, all that's required, but so little is actually spent on how to make them move around in the city. So some very clever people in a big research company uh, figured out that uh, the R&D spending globally on automobiles um, last year was about uh, $100 billion plus. And if you compare that to the measly $3 billion that was spent on traffic and intelligent transport systems. A weird analogy, right? We are stuck in this strange paradigm where if we can do something more about how we organize our traffic, it has much bigger impact on society than making cars more efficient. So the real question is, are we trying to solve the wrong problem? 
So this is where my team and I, we sort of work in hoping that we can solve the right problems with um, a paradigm that we want to introduce. Traditionally, cities, governments, and sometimes private stakeholders built infrastructure. And then services were deployed on top of this infrastructure, and then people used them. This was the old norm until a few years ago, till two things happened. There's a whole bunch of sensors in between these layers that are showing up. They're producing vast amounts of data. And the other thing that's really happening is the users, general, they themselves are generating data. So you and I generate vast amounts of data on where we move, how we use transport, how we make ourselves mobile. So can we harness this? Can we make good use of this and actually solve the right problem? Because traditionally, city planning and transport planning has been under this notion that people wanted to go from point A to point B, right? In the most fast, time efficient, and cheaper, if possible, way to get there. But the real truth about our lives is that it's a bit of a meander. We want to go drop off something. We want to pick up groceries on the way. We have kids on the way. Um, we change transport. I guess many of you came with the metro today. You experienced a multimodal transport system. But all this is multidimensional, multimodal, data-driven, sensor-enabled, sen and service-engaged. A combination of this is pretty potent. We all engage in this on a daily basis, but we are co-producing the service to a very large extent. But can we do something to make it more efficient and better? And the other thing that's happening in parallel is that cities are growing dramatically. Cities are going so fast. And people are moving ever more than history. It's incredible, the amount of air traffic, the amount of car traffic, bicycle traffic is growing in. Yeah. So what do we do? And how can we sort of bring these efficiencies and bring these things in scale, in industrial scale, is a real big question here. So our paradigm went from motion and locomotion, so we wanted to move. We sort of invented the wheel along the way. We figured out that we needed a motor somehow, so engines were discovered. Signaling came a little while later, but yeah, it did come. And now we are flooded with sensors and data. So what next? So this is where we start treating data as a creative raw material. And this is where the fun starts. So what we normally do in our everyday is that we gather a lot of large-scale data. We work with very huge data sets, and we try to optimize these things and do really meaningful and creative things with it. So just as a small example, we've been looking at the container shipping industry for a few years. I had the good fortune to work with one of the largest ones. And we looked at the data, and we looked at pattern recognition, because recognizing patterns, finding baselines, and finding a common ground to actually make actions possible is the first step towards this. So this, for example, just represents how the global container traffic moves around the world. It's pretty incredible, the export economies of China uh, more or less drive the container traffic outward into North America and Europe. Every year, believe it or not, just before Christmas, vast amounts of containers filled with all kinds of stuff end up in Rotterdam and Bremen and get distributed all over Europe. And then, right after New Year, they need to go back empty, millions of them, yes. So we're exporting a lot of air from here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So what we normally do on an everyday basis is we connect design, data, and science. And these three things are important. They exist in different silos, in universities, in companies, in organizations, even in the government, they're treated differently. But in my little studio, we treat them as a unified source of inspiration. Um, my amazing team, they put together some ingenious work, and I want to show you some of those things. Um, a recent example is we've been working with uh, the city of Copenhagen, the Copenhagen's commune, on figuring out how best to manage all this traffic chaos, yeah? and how to give a better priority to bicycles, pedestrians, and create a much safer and greener city. So we were proving to be really challenged here, because we didn't have an easy way of collecting this data. Because you could sit on the streets and count, of course, and we did that too. We actually sat on rooftops, and we uh, tried to see how traffic actually flows. And then we said, OK, once we start seeing some patterns, we start embedding some sensing capability. We start working with some pretty big uh, companies um, who work in network analytics and uh, sensing, along with some fascinating researchers from the Danish Technical University. And then we packaged all this knowledge, and we built a rather fascinating little tool for the city where we can actually 
model and emulate what happens on the street levels. Because this sort of emulation is the first step towards finding real models of how to organize our city, organize our traffic, organize different ways in which we can move. And this has a lot more efficiencies and scale rather than trying to tweak the automobile over and over again. Unfortunately, we don't manufacture automobiles in Denmark. So um, this is the business to go for. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's pretty important is to have a holistic approach to solving systemic complexity. Because one thing leads to another one, and there's so many cross effects, and the whole thing is a big, complex system. It's not like if you solve one thing, it'll automatically solve the next thing. Um, so a very fascinating thing happened. Uh, about six months ago, we got approached by the city of Copenhagen again to look at air quality. And we just loved it. We jumped at this problem. Because for the first time, someone had asked us to look at data of how to solve air quality issues. Uh, unfortunately, the city of Copenhagen is slightly above the EU norms today. Uh, so we wanted to see how to bring it in line with the EU norms. Um, so we worked with this outstanding bunch of people at the city. Uh, and we did this fascinating project where we try to understand how can you model and gather data, especially reference and baseline data, on a real time, continuously, on air quality. So our guys got to work, and they built a whole bunch of sensors. They got very excited, just ran some software, and then built some cloud services and put everything together in our little kitchen. Um, and then uh, came up with a fascinating system where we even uh, tested it with some dangerous gases. No, just kidding. Just in very small quantities, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, we built an unusual little box that's totally independent, can be deployed anywhere in the city, any part of the world, more or less. Has GSM connectivity, collects data in real time, passes all this data to our cloud service, and we can build all kinds of models on top of it. And the most interesting thing is that we can watch what's going on in street levels based on parking patterns, school opening hours, looking at what's happening at different times of the day. And we're using all this data to actually just gather insights right now. But the next step that the city is hoping to do is to actually use this insight to drive models to actually time traffic lights. Because it's not enough to just know. You have to take action. So we started building these interesting traffic model patterns now on top of this. And this is what we'll use to hopefully reduce the air quality issues in the city of Copenhagen very soon. But still, I want to remind us of one very important thing, that technology is not the ultimate answer for everything. And we want to take one step back. I'm still trained as a designer. I think the human experience is still the core central principle of most of these processes. And I want to highlight one example of where this human experience clashes with technology. Um, when I moved to Copenhagen a few, quite a few years ago, I was pretty amazed that this metro line was being constructed. It was brand new at that point. And I was like, this is the future. Like driverless trains that comes every two minutes, uh, extremely efficient transport system, changes the whole notion of commute and travel inside the city. Fantastic story. But then year after year, I started using it. And I started using it for daily commute. And I hit all kinds of issues. I started discovering all kinds of annoyance. And my mental threshold for how much delay means in my life dramatically dropped over the years. Today, if the train is late for a half, a sec half a minute, I'm getting impatient and walking around on the platform, right? Unthinkable. This is mental calibration. This has got nothing to do with technology. But the problem is you're setting expectations in people's heads. The world of apps and mobile phones are going to set a different paradigm of expectations and our mobility expectations, too. So what happens when such things happen? I started analyzing the delays and the problems in the metro system in Copenhagen because I got a bit tired and frustrated with the amount of delays. I don't know how many of you take the metro every day, but I do. Um, and I also use a bike in conjunction with the metro. And I started keeping a log, a manual log of all the delays that I was experiencing, because I wanted to keep track of what's going on and how to fix this. And I tried calling up the metro, but I didn't get much of a response. Um, so what, did, what happened? Suddenly, this year, they started tweeting about this stuff. And I jumped at it. This is an amazing thing. They started tweeting messages about all kinds of broken issues in the metro. And our guys, they jumped at this data source, and we started analyzing what the patterns were. Some 
ridiculous amount of delays and signaling errors and problems, the kind of stuff that you wouldn't normally see even if you went and surveyed people or interviewed people or stood in the metro all day. And this human element of our experience is so crucial. And I want to exemplify this a little bit, that we need to bring in empathy and responsiveness to our mobility solutions. Years ago, I want to go back to an old example. We did, Alejandro, my colleague back then, we lived in Italy, uh, and we did a small experiment where we strapped a camera onto a heavy suitcase. We filled it with books and rocks. And we said we want to do one thing. We want to traverse the city, one small town north of Torino, uh, and actually measure what it is to have an accessible city. So this is what we did. We basically mounted a camera, and we analyzed our moves through the city. So we set different kinds of tasks. We said, let's go grocery shopping. Let's go to the post office. Uh, let's go and find something. Let's uh, retrieve a car from a parking lot, and all kinds of things. We set ourselves different tasks, and we tried to execute them. And you wouldn't believe it, the number of hurdles, the number of issues that we faced, the smallest things start annoying you, including steep slopes. <laughs> If you're in a wheelchair user, you would be really um, yeah, a little paranoid to go down the thing. Um, even things like the crosswalk, crosswalk lights were not accessible at the right height. There were all kinds of traffic issues, uh, things where this is not designed. This is not, no one is intentionally doing this. These are consequence of multiple systems coming together and not being able to coordinate enough. And how do we find a solution in that space? Today, it's possible because you can sense things, you can capture data on this, you can quantify it, and you can take action on it. So it's totally doable. So what we need is much more than smart cities. We need fluid cities. We need cities that sort of lend themselves to different kinds of mobility solutions. We also need to go from the paradigm of multimodal transport to actually multidimensional transport. Because it's not enough to just connect two transport modes together. You need to time them well. You need to give enough information. You need to sort of make them resilient. You need to uh, allow this fluidity and multi-sensorial experience to come through in cities. This is what cities are about. Thank you so much. Yeah.